And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the system called uh, Sturgeon, which does tile-based procedural level generation via learned and design constraints. Um, this is going to be a pretty high level overview, I think, uh, but there's more information in the paper. So procedural content generation, right, uh, it's increasingly popular in games as a way to sort of automatically or semi-automatically generate content. Um, there's been a lot of work recently as well on procedural content generation via machine learning, uh, learning exam from example levels and example data and that kind of thing, as well as um, constraint-based procedural content generation and um, generating content using constraint solvers um, and that kind of thing. And combinations of the two where, you know, patterns of tiles and constraints are learned from examples and then used to, to generate um, uh, levels and things like that via constraint satisfaction. So this this work in the system kind of builds on a lot of that and kind of combines some of it and extends some of it in um, different ways. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, the, the overall system. Um, it is built kind of on what I was calling like a mid-level constraint API, which allows the use of a lot of different kind of swapping in and out different low-level solvers which has some advantages because you can find, you know, you can compare them and, and swap them in and out and, as you need. Um, oh, and then I'll talk about how this sort of mid-level API uh, allows to express some level design rules as constraints that can then be solved. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, performance comparison of multiple solvers that the system uses, show some uh, various example games from different genres that it can generate levels for, and uh, a few other applications that sort of go beyond that, that um, sort of the, the flexible nature of the constraint solvers, I think, allow. So the whole system is built on top of just simple Boolean variables and uh, essentially two kinds of constraints. Um, so there's an API. This is actually all implemented in Python. Um, so the API is kind of like Python functions, essentially, that you can call. So you have to write code um, to use it. At, the current point, um, but there, you can basically make a Boolean variable, and then you can also make something that represents, for whatever solver you're using, the the and or the conjunction of some some things. And then there's basically two kinds of constraints. Uh, you can constrain the count of some things to be in a certain range, and you can also uh, constrain implications. So you can say something implies. Um, a disjunction, so at least uh, an or of some other things, essentially. Um, and these are the two types of constraints that it solves, and everything is basically built on top of that. Uh, and the constraints can have weights and be hard or soft. Uh, and then you can, of course, run the solver. And when you run the solver, you can get the result out. And if you have soft constraints, you can get the objective value of the unsatisfied soft constraints. And from this kind of mid-level API, uh, it, it basically maps down to a variety of different low-level solvers that were implemented within the system, including uh, kind of SAT-style uh, solvers, um, answer set solver, and uh, SMT uh, solver as well. And in this work, the SAT sort of style solvers all came from the PySAT library. Uh, the answer set implementation was uh, Klingo-based solvers, and the SMT solver was um, Z3, which all conveniently have uh, Python APIs that can be used. And one of actually the nice things, and we'll see it later on in some of the timing information, hopefully, is that uh, it's very easy to plug in basically a portfolio solver where you don't actually have to pick one. You can just, you can run several of them at the same time and just pick the one that finds the answer first. So you basically get the kind of the best, uh, with a little bit of overhead, you know, the best of multiple solvers. Um, and not having to actually pick one. Um, based on this sort of just these very small kind of like mid-level API, um, it's possible to implement some design rules, what I was calling design rules for generating levels procedurally. Um, this is showing them kind of additively from left to right. So the first one is just that, you know, you want one tile at each location, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and then adding basically local tile patterns that were learned from example levels, adding a distribution, trying to match the distribution of tiles from an example level, and then adding the constraint that you have like a start and a goal, and the, the goal is reachable from the start. And so um, I won't go into too much detail on all of those, 
but the, the simplest one is just the tile rules that you have, you know, certain locations in the grid and for each location in the grid, uh, exactly, you know, you have one tile that you place there. And so, uh, the way that this, it does, this is essentially for, for every tile, for every location, for every possible tile that you might want to place in that location, you create a Boolean variable, um, for the, that tile being at that location. Um, and then for every individual location on the grid, you just add a constraint count that exactly one of those variables is true as a hard constraint. And so this is kind of like a one high encoding. And if you do that and you run the solver and you interpret the, you know, the, the Boolean results as that tile being at the location, you know, you end up with something that looks like this, right? Um, and so it's got tiles, but they don't really look like anything um, in particular. Um, then you can get pattern rules. And so this, there's been, you know, a decent amount of work in extracting kind of patterns of tiles from um, existing levels, but this is all built on using the, the implication constraints. So for example, if, um, if this were the example level that we were given, we can see that the, you know, the, the entrance tile here to the right of it is always a blank tile, right? I mean, there's only one, but that's always the case. So, you know, we could, we could sort of extract from that a constraint that, um, there being a, a, an entrance tile implies that the tile to the right of it is uh, a blank tile and so on. And so we can learn those constraints from example levels. And then just when we set up our constraint problem, just apply them everywhere on the grid, um, essentially. And one of the nice things about using this, uh, I think this flexible sort of constraint setup is that you can have a lot of these different sort of like patterns of relationships between tiles that you want to extract, including, um, hopefully my mouse is visible, but uh, including ones that basically uh, sort of do the same thing as like ingrams, um, things that the patterns, rules that kind of do the same thing as wave function collapse and so on. And, and this kind of the flexibility allows this kind of weird, what I was calling a Zelda gram, which is kind of an 11 tall um, ingram that goes like across and generates the rooms across. And then there's this extra little constraint along the bottom that says the you know, the, the bottom tile of one row of rooms constrains the top tile of the, the next row so that the doors line up vertically and that kind of thing, uh, which maybe shows some of the, the flexibility of the system. Um, and again, these, these are all implemented for the most part with the implication constraint. Um, tile distribution rules is relatively straightforward. It's just counting the number of each tile in the example and then proportionately um, having roughly that many plus or minus something in the output example, right? Uh, and these are soft constraints, so it's okay if they're violated, if it can't get quite exactly the right number, um, that's okay. And the system also supports kind of subdividing um, the, the grid so that you can learn sort of like the counts within each locations. Um, and this is useful for like in Super Mario Brothers, for example, clouds only appear like part way up the level. They're not like in the background everywhere. Um, and this gets those. And then probably the most complicated uh, set of rules is these, these reachability rules that basically say there's a path from the start to the goal. Um, and the way that that is implemented is, you know, in this case, we have sort of a cave maze kind of game. Um, from this green tile, you could imagine you could possibly go like north, south, east, west, but in this particular configuration, you can't go east, west because these are solid or what I call uh, closed and the north, south are okay because they're open. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of these reachability templates, a, a few of these reachability templates that, that basically say, um, for a particular location, where can you move to from that location if the open and closed tiles are respected, essentially. So for a, for a platformer game, for example, like this, this template part says, if you're in this square, and the tile under you is closed and all of these tiles are open, then you can move here, right? Which is kind of like the jump. Um, and so there's games with different kinds of like movement rules. Um, one of them, this is Super Cattails, which is kind of an interesting one. It's like a platform game that doesn't have a regular jump, um, but you can like climb up the walls and jump off the walls and that kind of stuff. So it was just an interesting way to see what, you know, how far could the, this system go? And uh, there's more about this in the paper, but essentially that gets kind of converted into a graph. And then you 
it solves uh, the constraint solver solves like a reachability problem on the graph subject to you can only use edges that have their open and closed tile um, respected essentially. Um, and one of the things you'll see in the examples is that it can find very convoluted paths. Uh, it doesn't actually care about finding a short path. It only cares that there is a path. Um, and it can also, as sort of a consequence of it, it can find these little closed loops that are basically off the path, essentially, because, um, you know, every point on this path is kind of reachable from every other point, but they don't, uh, you know, interfere with the actual path from the start to the goal. Um, just as a just to mention briefly, the system also supports basically two kind of flows um, through these what I call uh, tags, which specify like what tiles what what tiles you can put in certain locations. So there's a simultaneous flow where it generates both the functional level um, and the image for the level as well. So sort of like the functionality of the tiles, like whether they're solid or not solid or a question mark block and so on, and then the, what they actually look like. Uh, and you can also do it in kind of a two-step sequential pass where you generate the functional level first, and then that kind of limits what tiles you can place to generate the image level. And this maybe is useful because if you're doing pathfinding, you don't you can do the pathfinding on the functional level and then generate the image level afterwards, right? Because for the pathfinding, it doesn't matter so much what the level looks like. Um, in the work we I used uh, seven games, so there's this uh, kind of cave it was a custom made cave exploration game legend of zelda a tomb of the mask which is a game where you kind of slide until you hit the wall uh, super mario brothers and super mario uh, land it's a game boy game for any standard platformers um, kid icarus which is similar but has a uh, column wrapping and then super cat tales which is uh, also a platformer but with kind of unusual jumping rules um, this is some timing information again this is in the paper um, but uh, the end, so this is the time to generate the levels from, I think, 25 uh, examples and sort of a rough metric of the difference between the levels. Um, and so at least uh, with respect to the timing information, right, this is looking at the cave game, Kid Icarus and Super Mario Brothers and five different solvers. Um, and one of the maybe the interesting thing here is that the Klingo front end solver, which uses Klingo's text based language and Z3 solver, which are arguably like the more flexible of the solvers were actually the slowest. Um, and uh, yeah, so these two, Klingo front end and Z3, uh, whereas the fastest ones were Klingo's back end solver, uh, which you can access directly through Python and PySat's RC2 solver. Um, and so those are the two that I used moving forward. Um, and looking at larger levels generated by just those two, uh, I also created a, uh, a portfolio solver that basically just runs both of them in parallel and whichever one finishes first takes the answer from that. And here we can see that basically the portfolios, you know, in, in some games, uh, Klingo seemed to be faster and some games RC2 seemed to be faster, but the portfolio solver of course was sort of roughly comparable to the better one, I think, in both, although there's a little bit of overhead to coordinate them. Um, and then across all the seven games uh, with sort of a reasonable setup, uh, this is just showing that they the, the levels that um, are shown kind of in the paper in here took about 10 seconds or so to generate. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'll go through these relatively quickly, but just to show some examples, this is for the cave. Uh, this is for Legend of Zelda, uh, Tomb of the Mask, Super Mario Brothers. And here we can start to see some of the really convoluted paths and um, the difference in uh, patterns. So using the like the uh, an ingram kind of pattern can generate a little bit larger levels in about the same amount of time as opposed to the kind of like ring neighbor pattern. Uh, but there's maybe less flexibility. Uh, Super Mario Land. Kid Icarus, the same thing with Kid Icarus, the, the ingram based sort of pattern can make bigger levels in the, roughly the same amount of time as the, the, the neighbor kind of based ones, but the levels are very similar in Kid Icarus at least, uh, super cat tails. And so then it, we also looked into a, a several applications basically because you can just layer more constraints on top of this, right? So you can say, this is a constraint that says I wanted a pipe that's like exactly this tall. Right, and then you get this. 
Um, or you can say, I want three question mark blocks in the level. Note that the level, they don't have to be reachable and they looks like they aren't in some of these cases. Um, you can also put in, use soft constraints to do like maximization and minimization. So this one was asking it to um, maximize the number of gap tiles along the bottom. Uh, it also, you can also do things like infilling basically, right? You can put constraints on some of the tiles and then no constraints on some of the other tiles and run the solver and it will kind of fill things in or you can link together some generated segments of a level using a similar kind of process. Um, you can use the, the tag grid kind of that I mentioned briefly, um, which also supports void tiles, which are where there's nothing and you can make levels that are kind of weird shapes like this um, and cut, cut out spots of the levels. And this is a, a level repair example where you, you give it a, um, sort of constraints on what tiles you want to be in certain places, but they're soft constraints. So it tries to keep them as much as it can. But um, in this case, right, the the, um, the pipe is broken and it's too tall for Mario to jump over. So it fixes the pipe and it puts a little block here for him to jump over. Um, but this, this example took quite a bit longer. Um, you can do, these are just examples from wave function collapse, but you can, you know, layer more constraints on them, like how much you want in each thing, like how many flowers you want how many windows you want. Um, and then this is also an example of doing a kind of an expressive range coverage, right? Um, here we have a grid where the x-axis is how many solid tiles you want in the level and the y-axis is how many gap tiles you want in the level. So blanks along the bottom, basically. And then you can just kind of run a doubly nested for loop and run the solver for each cell in the grid and you get a variety of levels along those various axes. So if you can sort of express this, the, the thing that you're trying to um, look the, at the expressive range of as a constraint, then you can use this technique. Um, and then these ran with a timeout. So if it didn't find something in that time, it would, uh, there's a blank there. Seth, and, sorry to oh, interrupt. Oh, you're, you're done. Sorry, I was going yeah, to yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's it. So uh, I was just going to say uh, that I gave an exact talk a couple of days ago about once you have the constraints, you can kind of mix and match um, from different games and get interesting combinations. And I've also been currently looking at actually expressing the mechanics of the game um, other than just movement actually as constraints and generating like not just a level, but an example playthrough that shows that the level can be beaten in a bunch of different kinds of games. And so that's it. Thanks. I don't know if we have time for questions. <laughs>